Do not conform to this world, but refresh yourself through a renewal of your mind. And that I really, it kind of struck me as, as so much of a driving force of the walk itself to go out, look at the world afresh. Don't take what it gives you automatically, but you know, go through a kind of ongoing refreshing and renewal of your mind. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, the Boston Public Library, and the Leventhal Map and Education Center at Boston Public Library. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors NEHGS and a producer of the series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at our country's roads and byways, its people, past and present. For more information about tonight's guests, over to you, Kristen. On behalf of the Boston Public Library and the Leventhal Map and Education Center here at the Boston Public Library, we're thrilled to be partnering with American Ancestors, NEHGS, and the GBH Forum Network on this evening's program. We are going to be hearing from Neil King Jr. in just a moment, and it's my honor to share a little bit of information about Mr. King right here with you. Neil King Jr. is a former national political reporter and editor for the Wall Street Journal. He was deeply involved in the coverage of 9-11 that won the journal the Pulitzer Prize. He has also written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and other publications. American Ramble is his first book. He lives in Washington, D.C. Margaret, back over to you. Thanks, Kristen. And let's together welcome Neil. Neil, um, we are so glad you're here tonight in this busy season. Um, we are so sorry that we're not in person at the Boston Public Library another time, yep. um, but we're glad you're with us virtually. And as you know, I absolutely loved your book and I can't wait to hear from you uh, personally about this adventure, all that you saw and learned. So Kristen, thanks for your welcome. And Neil, over to you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you to both of you. And thank everyone on the, the call for joining me. I'm sad that I'm not up there. That was my plan, but it got waylaid by other events. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit, just, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one like this about the purpose of the walk, the idea behind it, and then toggle over to some of the slides, some of the imagery from the walk itself and intersperse that um, as I go with some readings from the book itself, um, short ones, because this was a walk, a walk that I intended to build into a book, and I want to kind of mesh the two. Um, I think it's important just at the outset to talk a little bit about why. Yeah, I live nine blocks east of the U.S. Capitol um, in Washington, D.C. One morning years ago, um, I just had this ridiculous idea. What if I walked out my door and just walked to New York? Um, why would you do such a thing? Um, what route would you take? And the idea at the start was sort of, well, I would just blaze up some route up I-95. And the idea just didn't go away. I, I brooded over it. I thought about it. I started reading about the old travel um, routes that people used to take, the postal routes. I started digging through the Library of Congress and finding all the early travel logs, not only by, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville and Charles Dickens and other well-known people who came to the United States in the early 1800s to kind of ask questions about this place. Would it last? What was it about? But there were dozens and dozens, hundreds really, of these kinds of travelers and writers that came with similar questions. So I immersed myself in those. I became obsessed with the early mapping of the country and what um, that said about um, you know, the indigenous villages and populations that were later, of course, um, eradicated, that went away, um, how it is we came to understand this body of land that uh, was so glorious upon arrival, um, and so many other questions. And so I then finally resolved, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to set out March 2020 and uh, make this pilgrimage to New York City. Of course, other events intervened in March of 2020, preventing me from walking out the door on the walk that I had barely meticulously planned at that point. And the one thing I just want to note is, you know, everything that happened between that March and the end of March of 2021, when I did set out, altered not only the face of the country in so many ways, but the nature of the walk that I was then going to take. Um, George Floyd's death, 
of course, led to this whole various unrest and everything else and a, and a, uh, a whole debate about statuary and who deserves to be honored and the whole uh, upheaval through the summer of tearing down of various statues and the like was such an incredibly interesting convulsion in our in our historical moment and so much else that happened that year COVID, the debate over COVID, the election. Um, you know, I was up on January 6th, I lived so close to the Capitol and I witnessed a lot of the events that took place there. And when I left on my walk, I went by a Capitol that was ringed by razor wire, uh, a thought that we could never really have imagined before. Um, but I just want to point out one last thing that outside of wanting to go on a walk where I would look at our past, the traces of our past, try to figure out um, various aspects of, of what I could hint basically clues along the way, I really went with the primary intention, and I quote the poet Mary Oliver early in the book, where she has a line that she says, attention is the beginning of devotion. And in a lot of ways, the walk was kind of a devotional walk, where I really just wanted to go out the door and pay supreme attention day after day, minute after minute, um, to the land that I was crossing and the things that it was telling me. Um, what I'm going to do now is share this, share my screen and um, get to um, the walk itself. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the route I took because I think it's useful um, to to do that. So, you know, I could have gone any number of different ways. This is just a sort of Google map kind of version. It's not exactly accurate, but, you know, I could have cut up along the Chesapeake. I could have cut across and gone up the Jersey shoreline. I could have you know, gone up the way that the Acela goes, the Amtrak route. I really realized the more I look at, looked at it that I had to go up across you know, the Mason-Dixon line at a very um, important part, the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. I had to go up into Lancaster County in particular, which is of course the scene of one of the great ongoing social experiments in American life, which is the Anabaptists, the Mennonites, the Amish, there were some quite extraordinary things that happened to me there, which I'll get to. Um, in the end, I, I kind of had, to, I couldn't miss Philadelphia. I went up to Doylestown, which is quite an extraordinary place for reasons um, that I might get into. It had to do with uh, a fascinating person naming Henry, Henry Chapman Mercer. And, and this is not ex exactly accurate. I had to go up, and up along Staten Island. Um, and then I went across to Jersey City and I got into Manhattan that way. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of the route I took. So, um, you know, when I left my house, I went straight west. Um, I live, of course, uh, on the other side of that capital that sticks up. And I went very intentionally to the Lincoln Memorial, um, kind of to honor not only one of our great figures from the past, but a place that we have, I think, all of us on this call and all Americans most in common. I don't know this for an absolute fact, but I think it's the case that most Americans of all places in the country have been on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And that concept of common ground and what we what it is that we share in common was something that I thought about a lot on the walk and wrote a lot about in the book. Um, you know, when you go out on a walk, one thing that you learn rather quickly uh, or feel rather quickly, this was the second day of the walk, is that you're kind of walking into these sort of parables. And this, the third chapter of my book is um, called the par is, a, is about these sort of parables. And this was a fascinating one I want to mention quickly, where I'm walking along, I come to a bridge along a road where this wide road had gotten narrower and narrower as I left Washington. And I couldn't cross this bridge. It was just, there was no pedestrian way. So I took this kind of the hidden high little old road off to the left and I ran into this couple and when they asked me their name was the herders where I was going and I told them they brightened at my mention of a town about eight days down the road called Ephrata in Pennsylvania where they had lived and they said oh we used to live there and we know this family that lives on Crooked Lane the Hoovers, they're a Mennonite family we haven't seen them in years we're wondering if they're still well and I said well look I'm uh I'm going to be there. I'm, I will go out of my way. I'll find them on Crooked Lane. And um, I will uh, pass along my good tidings to you. And um, so I left them and I went across this old bridge that was the old part of the highway. And this is what I said in the book. When I crossed that little bridge over Cattail Creek, I was amazed that by avoiding one bridge and taking another, 
I became a messenger of good tidings between plain folks who hadn't been in touch for years. If before I had been a pilgrim, now I was a courier, a deliverer of good news. I returned to the main highway, a different person in the same shoes. The next day, I, I went along and I met this guy. Again, you know, you meet a lot of these sort of um, roadside prophets, I guess you might say. And I was walking through this neighborhood, this again, also in Northern Maryland, and I ran into this guy, Ted. And Ted, you know, he was taking his uh, garbage can in and he said, where are you going? Where are you off to? And I said, oh, I'm on a walk from my house near the Capitol to New York City. And I described the circumstances and and um, he immediately launched into this sermon, which I, I said, Ted, stop for a sec. I want to turn my phone on. I want to record this, which I did. And this is what he said, which, of course, I put in the book. Here is what you're doing. Here is how I see it, Ted said, looking at me as though he had had a bead on my deepest intentions. We are all screaming. We are all reaching out. And your walk is to calm the storm, to center yourself to where you can be anchored in a frequency that will bring everybody into one harmonious vibration. So hopefully your walk will tune you. When you hit the tuning fork, it will give the right vibration that yields healing. And as you heal, every somebody else is going to get into tune and pick up on your vibe and heal. Your frequency can get us all into sync. And so brother, you are doing this walk and it's a holy walk, a walk of worship. <laughs> and I said to Ted after that, I was like, wait, do I understand you're saying that I'm supposed to be out to heal myself and in doing that, I'm going to heal the country? And he said, yeah, that's right. And I said, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to bear that burden. Uh, he was a great character, one of so many. And I said to him as I left, if uh, you know, I'd only set out my door just to meet him, he would have been worth the walk so far. And that was absolutely true. So one of the things that I um, was very intent on was, um, you know, close observation and trying to find treasured kind of hidden wonders. And this was a farmhouse that I managed to just run across when on the um, when I had come up to the border between Maryland and Virginia and um, Pennsylvania. And this is an 1820s German built farmhouse. Nobody was living there at the time. And right under that balcony is where the Mason-Dixon line it itself runs. So Maryland to the left, Pennsylvania to the right, theoretical freedom to the right, enslavement codes enforced to the left. Um, quite an extraordinary place. And I'm going to run really quickly a video. The sound might not be so great, but I just want you to sort of see the live version of this. If you look here, up that lane, you will see the exact line between Maryland and Pennsylvania, the Mason-Dixon line. It runs right through the middle of this incredible 19th century German farm, now completely abandoned. So the line goes right between these two buildings and right up that lane. That was um, quite an amazing place because I studied the, um, you know, the barn and you would go into the into the barn and see how all the hinges were different, um, all of them having been hand forged and handmade. And you really got the, the feel for the kind of ambition of these sort of settlers that had come during that period. And you know, even the construction of that balcony overhanging is quite, quite admirable. So these were the kind of things that, you know, they're there to be seen, especially if you take the time on a slow walk that uh, that I was on. Um, so I'm jumping forward now to the Susquehanna. And I had gone, you know, I'd done a lot of research before I left. And I tracked down this guy named Paul Nevin, who had devoted a lot of his life to these petroglyphs that exist on these two rocks in the middle of the Susquehanna, which are actually 
strikingly one of the very few remnants of, of indigenous art in a whole vast part of the eastern coast of the United States where, you know, people in New England, any of you might know of the big midden piles and things like that, where there were, you know, piles of oyster shells and other things. But when it comes to enduring artistic remnants like you can find in the southwest and other parts of the country, there are very few of these in in um, on the east coast. And Paul took me out onto this, these rocks. And, you know, these were a millennia old, at least, at least a thousand year old, where they had done all of these various um, figures of thunderbirds and animals of all kinds and, um, you know, prints. And they were quite extraordinary uh, things that he showed me. And um, I, that was on Easter afternoon. And I, I just wanted to do one quick reading to give a little bit of a sense of what this is all about. We stood and listened to the water gurgle as it rushed around the rock, heading to the bay and to the ocean. Our shadows splashed long across the stone. Just as there are hidden passageways in native mythology that give entry to the underworld, I had slipped through some magical door, the latched gate at my own house, and found myself here at this sacred place, toes gripping the warm rock as many others had for thousands of years. I closed my eyes to give thanks for the whole of it. Many times on the first dawn of each season, Paul has come to this rock to see how one or another of the large serpents carved in the schist a millennium ago point to that morning's rising sun. Seeing that, he said, just being there, it gives me hope, or maybe assurance is the right word, that this cycle we're all a part of will continue. On this Easter afternoon, Paul Nevin had brought me to his church. The continuance Paul spoke of was everywhere to see, in the carvings, in the osprey overhead, and the water gurgling around the rock, and in me, the walking man, drawn from afar to take it in. So I, from there, you know, having crossed the Susquehanna, I made it into Lancaster County, which is a profound jump of culture and land design and everything else. And this was a magical stretch of the walk. And this bridge that I encountered was such a beautiful work of art. It looked like something you might find in, you know, somewhere in Italy or something. And it was all the more mysterious because it didn't go anywhere. Um, it just went across at that beautiful span and then it sort of tapered off. At one time, I'm sure it had a, a place that it went, but it was right next to, um, this was my first covered bridge that I went through. And um, I'll just play the video because it's kind of fun. Walking through my first covered Amish bridge, I think I'll meet the Clarence. I just hope I don't get run over going through. I'm crossing the Conestoga River. Wow. Look at the amazing arched beams. There's the river. What a splendor. What a splendor. And all this countryside ahead. <laughs> what I find very funny about that, um, uh, listening to that, is you can just hear this kind of um, buzz of excitement that I had at that time, which was pretty much the way it was for the whole 26 days it took me to walk all the way to New York. This was just a photo I took because this was a day where, you know, the Amish and the Mennonites do their laundry. And this is a very common sight early in the week. This was, a, as I recall, a Tuesday. And it was one of those just gorgeous sights to just stand there and just watch this laundry flap on the on the line. Um, and, you know, when I had gone through this stretch, this was um, quite an extraordinary series of events. Anyone that's read the book will will know kind of how this became one of the hard, a hard the sort of beating heart of uh, of the book thematically in a lot of ways. And I had had this quite extraordinary experience where I'm walking along the road. And just because I looked to my right, I was sort of given access to this quite magical place. And I just want to read the start of this one chapter, um, which is called Renewing Your Mind, which gets to how I kind of made this serendipitous um, encounter. 
She was standing with her knees slightly bent in a patch of grass and sunlight behind a brick schoolhouse. She was focused on something in the distance and wore a long floral dress that extended to her ankles. She was in her early teens and had a white head covering over a bun of her hair curled neatly in back. I was walking up the road when I saw her and then caught sight of a leather mitt on her left hand. And then I heard the solid whack of a baseball bat. The way she drifted back and so effortlessly fielded a hard hit fly ball and hurled it back the other way, that and all the rest of it, everything made me stop in amazement. I knew that I had stepped through the wardrobe into a magical land. For eight days I had been walking, for eight days I had gone north and then bent my way east and had crossed a large river. It was a Tuesday in early April in the middle of the afternoon and an air of enchantment was taking hold. So this was quite a, one of these great moments where the kids then all came over to me with their lunch buckets. And this man standing on the right, Neil Weaver, who is their teacher, you know, he immediately said, what, what brought you here? And I told him and he said, kids, gather around. Let's hear what Mr. King has to say. And it was such a moment of welcoming and trust and their just desire to hear about my walk. And, I talked to them for a little while, and then one of the young women stepped forward and she said, Mr. Weaver, what what if we were to sing for Mr. King? And um, he said to me, do you have the time? And I said, yeah, I've got plenty of time. And we uh, went into the schoolhouse. They all went on to the risers. And here's a gorgeous day in early April. They've just been playing softball. Um, they're all, you know, eighth and ninth graders, and they immediately sing these multi-part gorgeous songs to me, hymns that Neil's um, aunt had written about the afterlife. And I'll play you just a short clip of one of the videos of those songs. That was uh, quite a moment, um, I'll just have to say. And, you know, afterwards, um, I had, oh, I'm jumping ahead here, but I had a um, quite an interesting conversation with Neil Weaver where he talked about, um, you know, the principles that the Mennonites live by. And um, one of them is this kind of curious non-conformity, which is, of course, they have their own conformities within their community, but they're very, um, you know, a austere in what they conform to when it comes to the rest of our culture that we all kind of adopt without necessarily a lot of thought. And um, he quoted in doing that a line from St. Paul to the Romans, which really resonated for me. Do not conform to this world, but refresh yourself through a renewal of your mind. And that uh, really, it kind of struck me as, as so much of a driving force of the walk itself to go out, look at the world afresh. Don't take what it gives you automatically, but you know, go through a kind of ongoing refreshing and renewal of your mind. By the way, I just wanted to flash on this image because when I made it to Crooked Lane, I mentioned the, the Hoovers and I found the father and son there who are these two hilarious characters. And these were more strict kind of Mennonites who do not like posing for photographs. So when I said to them, do you mind if I take a picture? They said, sure, if you do it on the sneak, and their idea of doing it on the sneak is that they kind of stand in profile and they don't pose, even though Lamar, the son, was was kind of grinning at me. And um, I just love that whole idea of doing it on the sneak. And that that's a very common thing you find in that part of the country. Um, so when it comes to the whole discussion of ancestry, um, which I know is, you know, one of the partners here, a big uh, issue, I mean, a big um, topic, I had this quite extraordinary experience where I had found, looking through the Library of Congress, um, mention of this house that a, a um, Farm Security Administration photographer had taken pictures of in the 1840s, or sorry, in the um, 1940s during the during the during um, that period when they had a lot of these artists going around. And he had noted that eight generations of the same family, the Fry family, had lived in this house. And I 
said, wow, that's really amazing. I need to find this house. I need to find if the Fry families are still living there. And so I dug around, I made some phone calls and I arrived at the house um, and met this guy, Simon Fry, who was at that point the ninth generation well, there were seven generations at that time in, in 1940. He was the ninth generation, and there was already kids that he had, which were the members of the 10th generation. And that, what he's holding in his hand, is one of these huge German Bibles that his family had brought over um, with them. And I wanted to do just a quick reading, because this is such a great um, thing, where he was, so how it was that they had arrived there. Simon's forebearer, Hans Martin Fry, came across with his, with his mother and siblings aboard the two sisters, which sailed up the Delaware and deposited them in Philadelphia. It was the third ship to arrive among the fleet of 23 that brought so many Germans across the Atlantic that year. I asked what month it would have been, and Simon pulled out the bottom drawer of the desk behind him and extracted a document, glanced at it, and said, they arrived on September 9th, 1738. He had in his hand a copy of the ship's manifest. And, you know, this whole grist mill where I was talking to him here was just filled with these extraordinary records. You felt like you would just walked into some archives of the, of the country, including this incredibly extant, all of the records going back to the early 1700s of the grist mill that had operated there. Um, and, you know, William Penn's sons had signed the original land deed, which he had framed on the wall. Um, that was quite a great afternoon where I got to kind of think about the whole aspect of those who stay where they are and those who keep moving, keep migrating. And I talk a lot about this concept of the anywhere people and the somewhere people. Probably a lot of us on this session now are anywhere people who have moved around a lot. Simon Fry was very much of a somewhere person. His people jumped across the Atlantic and have lived there uh, in that place ever since. Um, this, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but this was a bizarre and magical night where I ended up in Doylestown at this Mercer Tile Works. And if you're ever in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, you should go see not just the Tile Works, but the Mercer Museum, which is, I write about in one chapter there, which I call the Founding Tools. But this was a, not a place to sleep. I happened to have been in touch with the woman that had taken this place over and she turned it into a kind of spontaneous lodging for me and a couple of friends who would come up and it was a really quite extraordinary evening. So we're now, you know, I've gone past Philadelphia. Um, we're now on the Delaware Canal path. And, um, you know, which by the way, if you ever have uh, five or six days to carve out, I would recommend a long jaunt along the Delaware Canal path because it is one of the true wonders of the East Coast. Um, and I was on my way down to, um, you know, kind of think about uh, Washington and various aspects of George Washington's time and how it is to remember certain things. And I, I was going down to Washington's Crossing, where he, of course, came across the uh, Delaware um, on Christmas Day of 1776. And I, as I'm going down, I run into this guy Travis Manger, who's just out for a walk along the canal path, and he's on his phone, and he sees me, and he says, oh, I got to jump, and he says, are you that guy that's walking to New York, and I said, I am, and he said, do you mind if I join you, and he joins me uh, walking along, and he grew up right where Washington's Crossing is, and so as we go, he is telling me, this to some be an image of me kayaking across Washington's Crossing, um, but he starts channeling for me what it was like to be one of Washington's soldiers. And I just want to read a little bit from that passage because I thought it was so funny. People don't realize, Travis said, how dicey the whole thing was, how it could have all gone up in smoke, possibly snuffing the American cause, how tenuous Washington's hold was over his own troops, how dubious they were of the whole mission. Oh, how little some of them wanted to even be there. And then he goes on, these guys were standing in the bitter cold and saying, dang, this guy is going to make us cross the river on Christmas. My, my enlistment is up like I can literally go home in less than a week. I can get myself out of this bad situation and back with my family. And now I'm standing here and I'm freezing and I'm waiting for three hours as everyone else crosses the river. And I'm wondering, what is this all for? <laughs> and, you know, 
the, I, I kind of looked over my shoulder. I was like, wait, who sent this person to be this kind of muse, to be like the person who channeled, you know, the thoughts of those soldiers on that one particular bitter cold night. And uh, it was just a great magical moment, not only as a thing to put in the book, but to have experienced on the walk. And by the way, you know, everybody knows the image of the little boat packed with the people and Washington standing and all that kind of stuff. This is the actual Durham boats that were the type of boats that they crossed the Delaware on that night. Substantially larger, not at all like that little boat in the famous painting. So now I'm jumping ahead to um, a very funny moment, Cranberry, New Jersey. I had thought a lot about how was the wanderer going to encounter what I kind of jokingly called if a knight goes out on a big you know, expedition in medieval times, he has to encounter the dragon. And in my case, the dragon was going to be I-95, the Jersey Turnpike. And I get to this town of Cranberry, which is this beautiful, very well-preserved 19th century town, and very deliberately had wanted to go up Cranberry Brook, which goes under the Jersey Turnpike, where at exit 8A, where it's 12 lanes wide, and goes in between the warehouses of you know, Wayfair and Amazon and Costco and all that stuff. So it's an ancient river, you know, millennia old, going through all this sort of need it now temporariness. And I, my plans to walk up that river were not going to happen. And so I met these people there who spontaneously, including this guy, Tim Brennan, who was dressed up in this funny outfit for some school purpose. He was a teacher who said, don't worry, I've got the fix for you. I'm going to lend you my kayak. You can paddle up Cranberry Brook. And he told me about all the obstacles I would have to go over. And I said, Tim, that's great. What are you going to do? At the, what am I going to do with your kayak? He said, don't worry, just leave it up by the interstate. I'll come get it later. So here's a video that I make somewhat tongue in cheek of me approaching up um, what I was calling going into the heart of darkness and nearing um, the Jersey Turnpike. Well, it has taken me three weeks of walking, paddling, and in this case, kayaking up Cranberry Brook in a very mysterious location. And I've now caught sight right through those trees. You can see the flashing trucks going by of Interstate 95. And I'm not sure I'm going to get past all this stuff, but I'm going to see if by any chance I can get under it. It's been a long time coming, but there it is, folks. The beast itself, the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> uh, that was a glorious moment um, when I went through all 12 lanes underneath through this echoing tunnel. And um, just as I was going through this beautiful doe, this sort of young deer, crossed on the other side and was silhouetted as I went. And, you know, my sense, which I think is totally right, is that, you know, that river predates humankind by, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, probably. And um, who knows what will be the fate of the warehouses, the turnpike and all the rest, but um, that river will will continue. So this is flashing forward to the Arthur kill. I, you know, whenever I got to bodies of water, I generally had to find ways over them not not i didn't generally take bridges and um so on the other side where you can see that that's staten island and this is perth amboy on the left and uh, this was i won't tell the story it's too long but i i found this guy who i'm going to flash to in a second who owned that boat at the end of the pier which is called the peanut and he i tracked him down he ended up driving an hour in the next morning to uh take me across his name was Stu conway a really hilarious, great figure. I actually got an email that, or a text out of the blue today from his friend who's 87, who came with us on this one jaunt, who still remembers fondly that one morning as some kind of moment out of time. And um, and uh, anyway, that was just a great passage across and he was a real character. So, um, you know, moments, walks like this are made of uh, the characters that you meet along the way. And at the other end of Staten Island, I'm just going to tell this story briefly. I had struggled to figure out where I was going to stay. And that day I found the existence of this place called the Victorian Bed and Breakfast up in the very north end of Staten Island. So not that far from Manhattan at that point. And I, it was run by this great woman 
Polish emigre who had moved to the United States in the 70s named Danuta. And she put me up in her bed and breakfast and she hadn't had a visitor for or a guest for months or weeks and weeks anyway because of COVID. And was so thrilled to have me that she set, fed me dinner and did my laundry and made this lavish breakfast. And there was quite a hilarious moment the next uh, day where she insisted and I could not get her to stop that she was going to drive me to the Bayonne Bridge, which was about a mile away. And so I finally said, okay, Denuta, you can drive me. And when I got out of the car and I was wearing shorts, walking to the bridge, the last line that she said to me, out, she rolled down her window and she said, you have great legs, <laughs> which is really, really funny. It was sort of classic of her spicy character. So, you know, there I had had a lot of what I would call rapturous, extraordinary kind of out of body moments of joy along this walk. And this one, and I call this chapter towards the end of the book, Rapture on the Bayonne Bridge. And, um, you know, I was walking up the foot of the Bayonne Bridge and anybody who knows the Bayonne Bridge, I've been to a lot of events where people have laughed and I've mentioned that I had a rapture on the Bayonne Bridge and, you know, while other people have had heartburn on the Bayonne Bridge. But I was walking up and I wasn't really expecting to see the city. I don't even know why. And I was thinking about things, kind of looking at my feet. And when I looked up and saw the city, I was just like physically overwhelmed. And um, I just wanted to read one bit from that as to kind of how this came about. My delight sprang in part from the satisfaction of nearing the end of a long pilgrimage. It may have been tinged even by some fleck of regret that it was nearly over. I had seen for the first time, laid out against the morning sky, an outline of the place I'd been walking toward for 25 days, a skyline altered utterly by human hands with sheets of glass jutting to impossible heights from a sliver of metamorphic schist tucked between two rivers. But this weird rapture went beyond mere gratification. I had seen this skyline before. A thousand times over the years, I had caught sight of it from all directions as a cab driver and a common traveler. But on this morning, the sight of it physically astonished and stunned me. The days and all those steps had pried open a part of the human spirit that magnifies the potency of otherwise simple things and grants the commonplace a touch of the divine. And that was, in its strange way, a divine moment. And the whole rest of that day, I walked up to Jersey City and the next day I was going to go into Manhattan. And I, I was sort of sated. I didn't really have much need for more interaction, more discoveries. I, and I joke, you know, it wasn't my, you know, awakening on the road to Damascus, but my other sort of, you know, illumination on the Bayonne Bridge. And yeah, I think it really is testament to if you go out day after day, week after week, no, ear, no music in your ears, no podcasts, no distractions, and just watch a spring unfold, watch the landscape change, interact with the people. It just opens up a part of the spirit that a lot of us have sort of lost touch with. And um, I highly recommend such a thing. So I was originally going to cross the, the Hudson with a guy that I had tracked down. It was going to, we were going to go across on kayaks, but the wind was up and it wasn't great conditions. So he ended up getting a Boston whaler and we went across to Southern man. I mean, the Southern part of Manhattan on that. And it happened to have been the exact day, uh, 232 years after or something that, that George Washington had crossed that exact same portion of the Hudson on his way to his inauguration to become president. Um, I'm nearing the end here, but this was a great moment where I went into Washington Square Park and in the old days when I was a cab driver there, I used to play chess a lot in that enchanted corner of Washington Square Park. And I come in and there are these people offering chess games. And this young man who was 16 who lived in the village, you know, had his pieces set up and uh, I sat down and I had white and I played against him and won this just wild game of chess. I know that he was a better player than I was, but I had this sort of spatial sense that I'd been out walking for 25 days and it was a kind of wild gunslinger of a game. And, um, and I just, I, I, that was one of these things. I think of anything that readers might wonder if it's really true in the book, it's um, my description of that chess match and whether I really did win it, but it, 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 was a, it was a great moment on the last day of the walk. So as I went, 
uh, there, you know, I, I had people that met me along the way, and this is a friend of mine, Martin Indyk, who was actually uh, Bill Clinton's ambassador to um, Israel. And Martin and I, you know, I'd had a whole cancer ordeal that was a motivation for the walk. And Martin and I had had the exact same diagnoses essentially at the same time. And he had reached out to me saying, Neil, I want to meet you at the Atlas statue um, at Rockefeller Center, and I will be your guide into Central Park, which, you know, my destination was the ramble. I was sort of taking a ramble to the ramble. And so he um, led me on and we, um, you know, went up into Central Park. And, you know, this was this moment during COVID where in the spring, April of 2021, everything had gone off. You know, he did have his mask there, as you can see, but it was, we were all kind of liberated and we all, we didn't know the variants that were to come. And the whole of Central Park was just this riot of beauty and, and um, things going on. And so we walked the whole of the mall that you go up and we went under this gorgeous terrace that I'm sure a lot of you know of. And we were on our way to the Angel of the Waters, which is that famous statue of the angel above the fountain. And it was put there during the Civil War, actually, to honor the um, delivery of water to Manhattan. And I just want to read this last section. And Martin and I sort of having gone through these twin cancer ordeals that where we had had our relapses that paralleled one another and the whole of it. Throughout his ordeals, and still now as a treated one, Martin would come often to stand at this magnificent pool and bow his head to the angel of the waters. He came on the worst days when he feared he might not make it, and on a spring day like this, when new life burst all around us. As we stood there, Martin repeated the prayer he recites every time he visits, a common prayer from the Talmud called the Shechanahayu. He said it first in Hebrew and then in his preferred version in English. Thank you, God, for giving me life, for sustaining me, and for making it possible that I might arrive at this time. And, you know, that's kind of the ur er prayer of all prayers, just thanking whatever force for allowing any of us to be here at this time, at this present moment. And at that present moment, where there was so much beauty around us and so much celebration of the what we thought to be the lifting of COVID and that sense of communal survival, and in our case, Martin and mine, sort of personal survival, um, was just a magical moment. And going back before I end and turn this back over to Margaret and Kirsten, um, you know, so much of the walk in the book was really about kind of how we allot our time, the measurement of time, um, and the expansiveness of time that you can create for yourself if you pay attention. And, you know, not to get too out there, but it is the ultimate commodity. It's what everyone is seeking from us, which is our attention. And it's kind of, in the end, the only thing we have. How much attention do we pay to the moment that we have right now, which is the only thing we have. Um, so that's my final little uh, morsel and turning it over to uh, both of you to ask some questions and talk. Neil, that was absolutely beautiful. And we are just so grateful that you're with us now in this time and in this place. And um, this is just the most lovely thing during this season to, to have this moment hearing about this walk. So we are very, very grateful. And our audience has some questions for you. Um, some of them have read the book already and others are eager to. And I'm getting texts from friends saying, this is so peaceful. Thank you. So, um, but I'll start with a question here. Um, you mentioned in the book, which I've read, and I loved um, that you have gone back a couple times to some of these places, probably for fact checking um, or you know to just get a detail right. Or, but a question has come in: If you were to return to any of the places you visited, which would be your favorite and why? You know, uh, I flashed that beautiful bridge, the grassy bridge or the covered bridge. If I were anyone on this call, I would either by bike or by foot particularly in the spring, I would go and slowly move through that part of um, Lancaster County. The way that the Mennonites and the Amish have designed their homes, their barns, their farms, 
it it's just unlike any other part of the country it has a particular order about it it's and it you can drive through it but trust me it's not the same um and you know the world is just not the same at 40 or 50 or 60 miles an hour as it is at three miles an hour that would be my recommendation i have a lot of others but that would be my main recommendation thank you so much Neil, if you are you planning to do a similar walk elsewhere in the United States or internationally, and if so, where? You know, one walk that really um, intrigues me, and maybe some people on this call uh, would want to join me if they on some portion of it. And I've had this in my mind for a while: is to go to Plymouth and to start at you know the bizarreness of Plymouth Rock itself, which of course is a sort of shard of a rock, and walk from there to Walden Pond which would take about five days if you did it right. And, you know, that's a path more or less that Thoreau himself took multiple times and a lot of other people that did walking. And, you know, there's so much to trace in that stretch along there of the early railroads. And um, I don't know, it, it, it intrigues me. Um, but I also would like to walk, if I can figure this out, from my door and down to Richmond um, and, you know, to the from the U.S. Capitol to the old capital of the confederacy and that's a profoundly different walk than the northern bound walk that i took and the one point i just want to make about walks and my walk this was not a you know santiago de compostela walk or an appalachian trail walk it was an out my door walk and i really really recommend that people think about if they were to go on a three or four day walk out their door where would it be and then immerse yourself for days weeks months whatever in what's the story between those two places and then set out and do something like that. It's a very, very different experience than the kind of established trail walk sort of experiences a lot of people have, not to diminish those at all, but um, the out your door walk is, is, is really exploring the continuum that exists from our own homes, our own lives and the rest of the American landscape. Thank you. Neil, I'd love to ask a bit of a, a question that I, I guess is a little self-serving being a part of a map a map holding institution, but I'm super curious about what your research process was like as you were setting out. You mentioned a little bit taking time to visit the Library of Congress and looking on their holdings. And I'm curious kind of what you found there and how it shaped the walk that you ended up taking. Right. So, you know, you guys at the Leventhal Map Center, and then there's others of these incredible repository. David Rumsey is another uh, 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 organization that has these huge digital archives of maps in the Library of Congress. You can download them. And, you know, these early maps that the Europeans made of, of the country um, speak so much to this sort of um, sense of what it was, um, things that have now been erased. I mean, I, I write in the book about um, when this guy, Augustine Herman, in the early 1700s, went up to Susquehanna and mapped and named these villages, Lenape villages and some other villages, indigenous villages, that those place names have been utterly gone. They're erased. There's nothing that exists from them. And, you know, the, these, these maps are a testament to a moment captured in time. And a lot of them, of course, you know, sort of convey this sort of fabulous idea of what existed just over the horizon when people didn't know what was over there. And they're just a, a visual feast of um, kind of understanding how it was that we all came to understand this glorious uh, mass of land. So from my group chiming in, have you traced your genealogy? And if so, does it influence where you go, how you think about the history and landscapes there? I have. And that's another thing that I really recommend any of us do, because, um, you know, the, the tracings hidden in our blood are so much about what we are. And we are such complex individuals, um, you know, right? Uh, we were made up of everything. And, um, you know, one of the people I, I profiled a little bit in the book, I went to see him was a, a black German, a professor of German in, out in Lancaster County. And um, he was obsessed with his own genealogy. And he had done all the ancestry.com kind of thing. And, you know, he was pointing out to me that he was essentially 51% African and 49% everything else imaginable. And, um, you know, it was something that he was so aware of and so proud of um just the the you know complex nature of his own heritage and he was a person that had sort of just traced the whole story and you know in the, in the case of the actual walk no i i didn't go i there was no 
people that I'm aware of. I probably could have found some because, you know, one thing I write a little bit about, the Mennonites are obsessed with genealogy as well. And one of them had a genealogy chart, one of these things fanning out on his wall. And if you go back, 10 generations in your family, we're talking about like a thousand people, you know, so it's, um, it gets so complex and so numerous so quickly. And, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the further back you go, the more people you're related to, and the smaller the population of the world, which kind of leads you to the conclusion that we all came, well, we are all related, essentially, right? So. We've got a couple of questions about um, the act of walking itself. And a couple of people have asked, why was it important for you to do the walk alone? And can you say something about the act of walking and what it does for the walker? Oh, my God. Uh, so I did have a few people join me occasionally, friends that came. Um, and I, you know, flashed on Martin Indyk at the end. And those were, it was half day here, half day there. But I wanted this to be a solitary walk that you really immerse yourself in the thoughts and and soak up what it is that you're seeing. And you know, I, I, I have a, a chapter called The Sauntering Ones, where I talk about this, this sort of spiritual and historical nature of walking. And, you know, it is the reality that up until the invention of the steam engine, the pace of human life um, for all but the last 200 years was essentially uninterrupted by anything. Um, and we lived at that pace. Um, and it is a profoundly different um, way to experience other people and the land itself, it just enchants over time. And um, I really, you know, I've done a fair bit of other walks along the south southwest coast coast path in England and things like that. And again, even though I was touting the walk out your door phenomenon, just to build a trip around a long walk somewhere is such a, a sort of a mandatory thing, I think, for any of us that are fit enough to do that to do, because it just alters the way you perceive landscape and and the way that you encounter people and places as you go you know the, I, anyway i write a lot in the book about the nature of walking and the kind of um spiritual quality that it can have and um you know your immersion in the the very particular things i was very particular about the concept of particular you know just that everything has its own meaning its own merit pay attention to it immerse yourself in it you know, I'd love to ask a question. Um, someone asked a, a really interesting question about water and um, about the ways that rivers and streams tend to sort of be largely hidden from a modern, uh, someone who is, is in a city especially, but even someone who's living further away. Those, those things may not be quite as obvious as they might have been in their kind of original form. And I'm curious kind of what your reflection is on uh, you know, in many cases, stumbling into those bodies of water as you made this ramble. And what was that like? You know, that is a question right uh, that goes right to my heart, because I, I absolutely worship rivers. And um, I had spent so much time thinking about and sort of studying um, the history of the Susquehanna River, and the Delaware River, and the rivers that I was going to encounter, and the tiny rivers, many of which I waded into and fished, not with great success, but um, rivers are a big topic in the book itself. And, you know, the Susquehanna River is the fifth oldest river in the world. It's way older than the Nile. It was a river back when Pangaea was a continent. It it was, you know, it, it where it went and how it flowed has nothing to do with where it flows now. And, you know, we fly over these rivers when we drive on I-95 or we're on the uh, the Acela or whatever, and they kind of widen our retinas and we're like, wow, there's a river. But these rivers are, you know, worthy of stopping and and praising and honoring. And, you know, again, going back to the Walker's Day, when they encountered rivers in previous times, they were obstacles. Um, they provided water, but they were also hard to get across and they could kill you. And, um, you know, they, they, they demanded respect. And um, so when I got to the main rivers in particular, that was always a huge moment. The Schuylkill, the Delaware, the Susquehanna, um, the Raritan, um, you know, and these these things are the continuums, as I write about also. Land moves, land changes. Rivers are kind of the timekeepers of the present, but also this sort of eternal quality that they have. Yeah, thanks for that. Another question we got in advance. How much awareness of the history of the places you traversed did you find among the people you encountered? 
I imagine you tailored your conversation. Some people you sought out for history and other people less so, but in general, history awareness. Yeah, you know, so the, the book and the walk itself had to be a mixture of um, kind of meticulous advanced planning and time left open for serendipitous chance encounters to occur, like my meeting with the, you know, the various people, Ted, the roadside prophet. Um, so I, you know, in York, Pennsylvania, I'd agreed, I had arranged in advance to meet with this great journalist historian who walked me through a lot of the aspects of their past. I, I spent an afternoon with the mayor there who was a fascinating character who kind of lives in in this whole Thomas Paine kind of, you know, revolutionary era um, nostalgia trip in a way. And I spent time with this incredible woman, Samantha Dorm, who, um, you know, is tending to a black cemetery there that is was basically this repository of deep memories that had been kind of eroding away. And there's a project going on now to uh, basically unearth all these incredible um, things from the not that distant past. And so there were a lot of um, those historical things that I really wanted to dig into. And so much of the book in that way was about why it is we remember what we do and how we do and why is it that we don't acknowledge or 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 even note certain other things you know so when i got to manhattan the first memorial that i had really seen throughout the entire walk that was of great importance to me and probably everyone on this session was going to the kind of gaping hole memorial that is the 9 11 memorial at the world trade center and um you know that's a pretty extraordinary thing and it was exactly 20 years down the road from those events i think we have time for one more question um Neil, what would be your one takeaway from the experience that you'd like to share with everyone here on tonight's program? Wow, that's such a difficult thing. You know, a lot of people will ask, and I'm, I'm going to do a little reading here at the end that might sort of touch on this a little bit, but, you know, what does one make of America if you go out and walk it? And, um, you know, I, I came away with a lot of very positive feelings about um just the importance of being with people on their same patch of earth, what we you know know of as common ground, their front yard, their driveway. And you know, you have political differences or whatever, but there are other aspects of all of us that in the best of moments make up for the differences we might have on other issues. And so I came away quite um, upbeat on that kind of thing. But on the other hand, I'm very fully acknowledging that if I had taken a right here or left there. And if this person had emerged and done this or that to me, I might've had a completely different experience. And I'm also quite aware that I had the experience I had because I am the person I am and others might've had very different experiences because of being different people and presenting differently. And um, so I, I'm hesitant to generalize in that way. Well, I, I agree with Kristen um, in this busy season. We uh, should keep moving on, but we are so grateful, Neil. And thank you for this Q&A. It really brought out even more information. Um, as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we've asked Neil to do a final reading from his book to give us a, a lasting impression, a bit of an inspiration. Over to you, Neil. Thanks. So this is from the Post Amble. Um, friends asked what I had learned and I tried to explain. If you go out your front door with an eye for all that baffles, amazes, enchants, and keep at it day after day, giving into the landscape and letting the rhythm of your steps guide you, it's astonishing what can ensue. Within days, you understand why the holy books have whole sections built around the stories, the one-off encounters of men and women out walking. Very particular things, a sermon by a man out getting his trash can, the hand forged hinges on an old barn, how the maples flower, then leaf, acquire very particular meanings. They tell stories that weave together into a riddle that is long and flowing and difficult to explain, should you feel the compulsion to explain. You bring meaning with you when you go looking for meaning, and the more of it you bring, the more you get in return. 
What a wonderful image. Thank you, Neil. You are inspiring me. You're inspiring all of us to go off on a ramble soon, or at least go outside and see the trees and say hi to people in our neighborhoods. So this is a really wonderful holiday thought. Um, thank you. Um, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have co-presented this with you. If you out there are researching a time, a person, or a family, my colleagues are here to help. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists. And our Brew Family Learning Center um, hosts many educational programs providing skills for family historians. Um, we can provide direction on all sorts of records, times, and places that make up America's history from revolutionary days to today. Special thanks to our inspirational guest, Neil King Jr. And thanks to the Boston Public Library, Leventhal Map Center, GBH Forum Network, and to the audience out there in Zoom land, thank you. We appreciate your interest in America's history in all its diversity. Um, we wish all of you a good night and happy holidays ahead. Mm -hmm.